do you go to school around here? Yeah, at the uh, U of I. Okay, awesome. Just uh, hanging out for the summer? Yeah, just working full time, trying to make money and yeah. Okay, so what's your, what's your reaction? The Bible forbids prison for punishment. I don't have an inherently good or bad uh, reaction to it. It's just, I have never heard that and would, would be uh, curious to know why and what verses would support that. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, so the Bible lays out like a whole system. So like if somebody steals something, they have to pay back what they stole plus an additional penalty or something like that. Right. So I'll give you uh, one example. There was a friend uh, of mine, not a close friend, but we knew his family. He, um, he was picked up for stealing cars in Oklahoma and then t taking them to Texas and selling them. Mm -hmm. And so he went to prison. He's a felon now. Um, he think he went to prison for about two years. And then when he got out, the people that he stole the cars from were like, hey, we'd, we'd, like, our, we'd like our cars back. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, in that case, prison basically prevented him from fixing his mistake. He had to wait two years. And now the people who are out the cars are like sitting there twiddling their thumbs for a couple of years. Sure. Sure, yeah. I can certainly see how the modern uh, prison system doesn't inherently favor um, the victims of the crime. It just uh, is very, um, well, it's focused more on uh, retribution. But uh, the Bible verses in uh, question, uh, do you recall the reference for that? Sure. There's one, uh, I believe, it's in Deuteronomy. Let's see here. There's a verse that says, it's a little bit cryptic. You kind of have to expand it a little bit. Sure. Oh man, do I have cell service here? Um, if you can Google, if you have service, you can Google it. It's, uh, uh, you shall not take a millstone or an upper millstone in pledge for any debt. So what that's talking about is, let's say somebody owes me something. Let's say they stole something from me and they owe me money. Right. I can't go and take some of his t tools that he needs to work to earn, earn a living right. in order to pay that back. Yeah, so that's Deuteronomy 24.6. Yeah, do not take a pair of millstones, not even the upper one as security for a debt, because that would be taking a person's livelihood as security. That's an interesting NIV translation. The tr one translation I'm thinking of, it says you shall not take, because that would be taking a life in pledge. So in other words, if you can't take a guy's tools to work as like collateral for a debt until he pays you back, like, wouldn't it follow that you can't take a person's body hmm. itself to hold it as collateral? I would imagine so, yeah. Um, but I, I guess where I'm seeing the, the uh, distinction is in uh, laws for a person and laws for a government, you know, because it's, you know, very um, clear at least to me that it's uh, talking about people. Like, you as a person shouldn't do this, but it's not talking about how a governing body should behave or control their citizenry exactly or, okay yeah. how would you uh, respond to that that it, it's more of a personal uh, command than it is like a governing you know piece of legislation that's interesting so so like the same way that i wouldn't be able to go out and like punish somebody for a crime i'd have to go through the court or whatever to do that is that is that basically what you're saying like i i don't personally have that authority but the but the ruling authorities would. Right. Do I, so I have that right? Uh, yeah, I would say so. Okay. Um, I could see that except when somebody does do something wrong, the Bible does outline like what's supposed to happen. So in order to put somebody in, in prison, it would preclude them from actually doing the things that they're supposed to do. Let's say, um, let's say somebody uh, beat up my dog and he's like, I, I want the medical bills paid for or something like that. Um, if somebody goes to prison, like, I, how's, how's he gonna pay? If he's not able to work right now, how's, right. How's, how's he gonna pay for that? It, so in that sense, it kind of slows, it slows things down and like speedy justice is a good thing. Right. So then is it a prison that is a forbidden or is it simply um, not allowing them to, uh, you know, give a uh, recompense in the way that the, that the Bible uh, commands uh, what's wrong in this well here like what I'm saying is if they were able to um, you know repay for their crimes and then go off to prison would that be you know acceptable 
Well, so then the question is, well, who do they owe something to? Like, I know we talk about, in American society, we'll, we'll talk about, like, somebody owes a debt right. to society, right? And they have to pay that back by going to prison. That's a good idea, except... Um, um, that's costing society money, right? It's not free to, to hold somebody in prison. It costs like essentially like a year's wage to hold somebody in prison. It's like 30, 40 K a year to have somebody in prison, depending on level of security and that sort of thing. So if the person, let's say somebody beat up my dog and he fixes it, so he, my dog goes to the vet, has surgery or whatever, so now my dog's whole again. Mm -hmm. Like, what, what is there left for him to do? Why, why do innocent people out in society need to continue paying to do something to him? Like, hasn't he fixed his mistake? Sure, you could see it that way, yeah. And I think that that certainly is not a wrong interpretation. I guess you, you could just see it as, like, um, he is uh, paying back both the person or uh, persons that he's wronged and the government, um, uh, because of the laws that he broke doing so, so he wrongs, you know, not only an individual, but the society as a whole for going outside of their, you know, norms, their laws. Okay. Um, I would say that's extra biblical. It's like putting on additional... Now, mm -hmm. obviously, like, depending on the thing that somebody did wrong, um, so the Bible actually gives, like, different penalty levels for theft. Let's say, let's say somebody... Um, picked up um, somebody's bike on the street yeah. and took it home. And then somebody comes to him and he said, hey, have you seen my bike? And he says, no, I didn't. Well, okay, so now he's he stole something and now he's lied about it. So if somebody eventually finds him that he has the bike, then he has to pay the bike plus the value of the bike as a penalty. Mm -hmm. So that way, what he had meant to do to somebody else gets done to him. So that way it's sort of a teaching tool. I see. Um, and then let's say he steals it and then he feels guilty about it and he's like you know what i'm you know i talked to my wife or somebody at home and i'm really starting to feel guilty about it so he takes it back and he returns it but when he when somebody asked him hey did you did you take this and he lied about it and said no well, okay so now he's definitely a thief because he's lied about it but then he feels guilty goes back then the penalty is actually reduced so it's it's he gives the bike back and then he adds a 20 percent uh, fifth of it onto it so as sort of a reduced penalty for coming forward and and turning himself in so to speak and then um, the worst one is uh, if you steal something and then you're um, let's say I stole the bike and then I sold it mm -hmm. and then somebody finds out about it and they're able to prove it and I don't have the bike anymore it's gone right. well then I have to pay for well the, the bike the value of the bike and then four times the value of the bike on top of that so it's sort of a, if you get rid of the evidence, then it's going to be, and you're caught, then it's going to be much worse for you. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of the system that the Bible lays out in terms of, like, uh, just theft, which is, I guess, supposedly the, the simplest thing to kind of go through and explain about why people, why somebody would go to prison. It's like the first thing some, comes to mind. There's obviously okay. stuff for, like, violence and sexual assault and things like that, too. But in terms of property th theft, it's, you know, wh how, how, dubious were your intentions. Are you stealing it to make a profit? Okay, well then it's a four four times penalty. Mm. You, are you, did you steal it and you're caught with it? It's a two times penalty. Did you steal it and then you turn yourself in? It's a 20% penalty. So that's the, that's the basic system that it lays out. Okay, I guess, um, and I ask this because I just don't know, um, was that, you know, Old Testament law, you know, for the people who it was uh, written to and like it was, you know, abolish as an old law or is that like a biblical like a man for you know everyone for eternity you know it's an interesting question um when god pulled the israelites out of egypt the first thing that he did was like i'm taking you out of slavery and i'm going to give you the law mm -hmm. wait, wait wait what god took them out of slavery to to like put them under a yoke of slavery again to the law i think it was because god wanted to show them like what the laws of a free society would be like i'm taking you out of slavery now if you want to be free and like if you're familiar with uh, it sounds like you're familiar with the bible um yeah i'd like to, to uh, think so as um a christian <laughs> okay well i'm a christian too and sorry what was your name again sean sean um so yeah that's good uh, that you have a background in some of this stuff um 
Yeah, so God brings Israel out. And I do think that God gave Israel, and he, he specifically says this, um, I think this is in Deuteronomy 4, verse 5, um, where he says, uh, keep the laws and do them so that, that will be your wisdom and your understanding inside of all the nations mm -hmm. who when they see these laws when they hear of these laws will say surely this is a wise and understanding people for what great nation has a god so near to it as our god is to us whenever we call on him mm -hmm. so i think it was meant to be a witness and a testimony and then obviously in the new testament paul says we don't nullify the law by our faith we establish it by our faith mm -hmm. so we're supposed to set an example for people that don't know god and they're supposed to say, hmm, those, there's something different about those people and the way they live. I don't know, I don't know what it is, but um, I think it's in, there's another, there's a prophecy in Zechariah 8 too that talks about um, uh, in the latter days, talking about the new covenant, 10 men will grab hold of the sleeve of a Jew and say, take us with you for we've heard of your God. So that, I think that's the pattern that God has sort of set us to, to follow, to be an example and to show you establish the law and then you, people can make sense of Christ mm -hmm. when they understand that there is, they are, they are sinners. Now they actually will understand the need for a savior. Okay. Wow. Yeah. I've just never heard this and it's really eye opening. Like, th yeah, this is all uh, good stuff. Um, I guess another question would be, so what about the crimes that aren't uh, specified in the Bible that, you know, maybe aren't listed because there's a wide a variety of crimes that one could commit. So what are those? Um, so what would be an example? Like uh, marijuana or meth or uh, well, something yeah, that's not explicitly yeah, mentioned? Yeah, yeah, just uh, drug use or maybe, you know, I don't know, you, you know, don't pay uh, child support. I'm just trying to think of example. I don't know. Mm, yeah. No, child support. That's a really interesting one. <laughs> um, the drug laws, I'm actually not sure about those myself. I know I did encounter one guy who was talking about um, when the Bible forbids like being a medium or a necromancer, the one of the one of the words there is related to like apothecary. Yeah, I've heard or that. Or something like that. Okay, you've heard of that. Yeah, okay, so like, you are like a little bit deeper into this. For thing. a pharmacy, right? It's like the the same term as like sorcery. Yeah, so like drugs, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a really interesting argument. I need to I need to look more into that. Right. I, yeah, I would have no idea. I mean, I just yeah, it's all very new to me. Sure. Yeah, um, other things like paying child support. Hmm. So like basically what happened was uh, a guy, he was either married or didn't, had a, had a kid and then basically skips town. And now there's a single mother in charge of, and essentially a widow, but she may or may not be married. Right. Basically. So um, then child support. Hmm. Well, because I, I know that the Bible is... Uh, very clear that a believer who doesn't support his family is worse than an unbeliever. Um, I don't reckon, or I don't recall that there was any um, specified punishment for such a person, though. Yeah. Um, well, he would obviously lose his believing community. Mm -hmm. um, that would come with its own drawbacks. Like, we we're supposed to give preferential lending to other believers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, community. Yeah, that's that's a that's a really interesting one to explore because I think to a large extent, Christians don't really, if they had to like switch churches or whatever. I think a lot of people are sort of like, eh, you know, sure. I could. I mean, it'd be a little inconvenience, but it wouldn't be like life shattering. Sure. sure. And I think that. I mean, I'd like for that to change. Certainly. Yeah, and so it would seem as though most, if not all, of these uh, um, uh, punishments are societal that they come from the, the people and the uh, community and not from the government or a, a, a governing body. Is that right? Is that a good understanding? Um, meaning like the given laws in the society or, yeah, like, it, you know, like who, who uh, punishes who, like, you know, it's, it's uh, you and your, you know, um, aggressor or the person who has wronged you and not the governing body on your behalf, you know, who, who, uh, who goes after, you know, the person who, did the wrong thing. Right, so it would be more of a um, like societal shunning sort of thing, where it's not necessarily illegal, but I'm trying to think. Something that's yeah. highly frowned upon by society, like being yeah. a ticket scalper or something. Sure, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I th there are a lot of things that are that I think are wrong and would be necessarily, the Bible would categorize as sinful, mm -hmm. but there's not necessarily like a court penalty for it per se. Okay. Right, and so yeah, so then most, if not all of 
the punishments that one could give, or at least uh, should give, uh, biblically, uh, come from the society and not from like you know a governing body. I mean, that's the correct interpretation of that, right? That yeah, for that. things where I think it doesn't outline a certain thing. Now, for certain things like society, I think the Bible lists um, like whipping somebody as an option. Like Paul was obviously whipped and scourged, right. things like that. Mm -hmm. um, like, and 40 is the limit, and it gives procedurals, like you shall cause him to lie down, and you can't give him more than 40 or else he'll be degraded in your brother's sight. Um, right. So there's a, a few different options. There's like corporal punishment. Um, there's even one that talks about like loss of, loss of limb. So either if you cause somebody else to like lose a leg or something like that, then uh, either yours, I would think back then, you would take that person's leg. Now I think there is actually a way you, you can basically restore with prosthetics mm -hmm. or like even electronic robotic arms and stuff right. would be would be a good very expensive extremely right. expensive but still maybe a better option than having your own arm cut off for whatever reason um so uh, yeah there are certain things that i think that are told to be done by like city officials okay. and then obviously like um something as serious as like execution was to be carried out by the whole community as a whole you had to have a judge rule on it first right okay. yeah. but then like somebody would be publicly stoned and it was meant to serve as like a warning like this resulted in somebody dying and we want this to be a a serious warning to people and i don't like god specifically says so that you'll be afraid of doing this again right basically and, and I Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I've been talking too much. Oh, I just had a, a well, a, a question um, in that line is, um, so capital punishment, do you agree with that or is that a biblical? Uh, I do. When it's lawfully practiced, yes. Right. Okay. Because I know that some Christians are totally against it, you know, the taking of a life in any form. So, you know, I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. That's a good question. Uh, yeah. I think it's definitely applicable and. I think there's like maybe 80 or 90 different offenses. Some of them I have questions about, like how in the world would that be applicable today? There's one that's like, sure. if anybody eats the sacrifice of peace offering on the third day or after is to be put to death. Okay, well, but the nature of the temple has changed. Right. So now we offer sacrifices of good deeds, praise and service to one another. Right. So, um, but yeah, that's a really good question. I, I'm interested to explore a lot of those topics myself, but I think there are some that are like really straightforward, like, okay, don't kill somebody. That's, that's a pretty basic straightforward thing. Right. And that even goes back to like Genesis before the law. Mm -hmm. God says, whoever sheds man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. Mm -hmm. So some people better in that anti-death penalty camp are like, oh, but I still do agree with murder because that was given before the law and that continues forever. So okay. there's a lot of really interesting questions about like continuity of the law and because Hebrews does talk about it, like when there's a change in the priesthood, there's a change in the law as well. Mm -hmm. And so there's definitely a lot of things to consider there. Certainly. And Joey, did you want to talk, ask yeah. questions? I mean, I don't have a lot to say. Yeah, here, you want to? Sure. <laughs> And it was Joey? Yeah. I'm Adam. Adam. What are you doing this for? Uh, I think a lot of stuff people are unaware of. Like, there's been a lot of people driving by. I was unaware of this for a long time, too. Um, they just don't know what's in the Bible, and they're just sort of happy to let that be, stuff be talked about in church, if it is ever, and it, like, rarely. There's a lot of things that are just rarely touched upon, especially, like, societal norm things. I think a lot of people are just kind of afraid to rock the boat sometimes and challenge conventional conventional wisdom yeah. yeah I think that's I mean it's a really good point I think that America's done a terrible job of well I mean we've done a great job of separating our what we believe in what we practice in politics hmm. um, and just separating that and I know a large portion of America at least still claims to be Christian but you know we don't have anything close to Christian values in our political system so I definitely agree with that. When it comes to prison, I'm a little, I'm a little interested in how the, the Old Testament law like that applies to us in our New Testament, um, you know, New Covenant, right? Um, and one thing that I was thinking about is, like you were talking about, the punishment for murder is capital punishment, right? And you look at some of the murderers in the New Testament, like look at Paul. He mm -hmm. killed Stephen, right? But he was he, not. He stood by with Stephen, but he, he did take part in others that he talked about to some of the other churches in his letters. 
Right, right. He took part in that persecution, but he wasn't killed for it. And I think that there is something to be said for, okay, so now we have this new covenant, and maybe we don't kill every person who is a murderer, because we can see that there can be redemption there and that Jesus can work with anyone, no matter what they've done. But what do we do with that person? Yeah, that's a really, Paul's a really interesting example because there was one point where he was actually brought before like a Jewish body. And Paul told them, he said, if I've done anything worthy of death, I do not seek to escape death. So Paul's attitude was like, I'm not trying to shirk anything that I've done. Like he owns it, he takes full responsibility for it. And that's a key thing that Jesus even uh, commended Nicodemus for. Like when Nicodemus was, uh, came to Jesus' house and he was the tax collector, right? He had defrauded a whole bunch of people of taxes and things. And so uh, after listening to Jesus, he goes up to Jesus and he says, if I've defrauded anything of any taxes, I'll restore fourfold. And I think that Nicodemus was kind of referring back to that law in the Old Testament that says, you, you know, if somebody steals an oxen, it'll be four oxen, f uh, four, or four sheep for a sheep and five oxen for an ox. Which meaning like you've you've gotten rid of the stolen property. So he's already spent the money that he's stolen. So he's like, well, the penalty for that's fourfold. So I don't think Zacchaeus was just, er, did I say Nicodemus before? I meant Zacchaeus. Um, I got you. He was, uh, he was, I think he was understanding that, oh, this, the law says that I do this. And he rejoiced in, in having that attitude. And it's interesting, Jesus's response to him was, uh, salvation has come to your house. That's a play on words, right? Because Jesus's name is like, the Lord saves. So Jesus's name literally means salvation. And then he tells Zacchaeus, salvation's come to your house. Well, obviously that's true because Jesus was physically come to his house. But I think Jesus was also pointing out to the evidence of his faith, saying that, no, Nicodemus, you, uh, Zacchaeus, you want to do what's right. And that's what the new covenant is all about. It's a heart change. And Jesus, I think, could sense that his heart changed. So I think that should be our attitude, especially as believers, of owning up to our mistakes. Because Jesus has called us, right, to, to own up to other people's mistakes. Because Christ did the same for us. So then, well, how can we be owning up to other people's mistakes if I'm just having trouble paying for all my own wrongdoings? Right. And I mean, I... That makes sense in a Paul situation, right? If you had somebody who was walking the streets and killing people, and then they were, um, you know, they came to some sort of revelation and they're brought to Jesus, then yeah, I would hope that they wouldn't continue to kill people, right? Right. Um, I would hope that there'd be that change there, but then what do you do with that person who doesn't have that redemption story yet, you know? Um, what happens there? and? Um, I mean, I don't know the answer. I don't think I have any idea what the answer to that is. But that's my main, you know, do we say, okay, this person has killed somebody and they haven't shown a heartfelt repentance while we kill them? And to me, you know, the next step down from murder is, in prison, or not murder, but capital punishment would be imprisonment, right? You know, if you have somebody who commits a crime, but it's not quite worthy of death, then they go to jail. So I would think that, yeah, I think jail is a useful tool that we still can use nowadays, but. And Jesus did use it in a couple of parables to like illustrate the point. Like you have the unforgiving servant. I can hardly hear myself talk. You have the unforgiving servant, right? Who his master forgave him like a huge amount of money, millions of dollars essentially. And then that servant goes out and is telling somebody what, uh, um, he finds somebody else that owes him a smaller debt right. and, and basically tries to shake him down for 20 bucks or a day's wages. Right. And uh, so then the, the master brings him back in and says, like, what, why haven't you forgiven? Because I forgave you way more. Can't you forgive this small amount to your brother? And then so he says, take him and like put him in prison, at, to give him to the prison torturers until his debt should be repaid. I think that parable is using it as sort of an analogy for hell, right? Whereas like, okay, well, you've died the second death and there's no escape from that. Right. Well, and I mean, a notable thing about that parable is that he says, put him in prison until he can pay off his debt. But there's no sort of 
way to pay off that debt. You know, the prisons back then were not anything like the prisons we have nowadays. Sure. And, you know, you're just sitting in a cell all day. There's no way he can repay his debt if he couldn't already, which we know he couldn't, mm -hmm. because he can't work while he's in prison. Right. I don't know if there were any, like, yeah, the idea is that you're stuck there forever. Right. Well, I know in Texas, like early prison history, I don't know if they still do this, but they used to make the inmates all like manufacture license plates. So they would actually like put them to work. And a lot of prisons will still do that where you can work and they have like concessions where you can buy like a pair of socks or whatever and it costs like 30 cents, but you only are getting paid like a couple of cents an hour or, or something. But it's, I think even the prisons have figured out that it's a useful thing to like, no, you put somebody to work. When they owe a debt, they're supposed to repay it with their own hands and not. Because if there's a debt that goes unpaid, like an insurance company is paying for it, which means they're charging rates to a whole bunch of people. And so, so it's like that ripple effect spreads out to everybody. Or if Walmart has, is having a whole lot of like Nintendo Switches stolen, then well, they're going to have to start, like, jacking up the price of switches, or they're, the cost is going to come from somewhere, right? They have to right, recoup that. Right, Yeah. And I can see definitely with theft, how especially, like, minor level theft, like, how that would be, you know, maybe they don't need to go to prison. And again, you're right, that totally puts a burden on us as a society, right? We're paying for that person who's in prison. So we have to decide what's worth it. Because, yeah, with theft, it feels like, a more appropriate punishment would be that they pay back what they've stolen. And that doesn't cost me any money as a taxpayer, and that helps the victim more than going to prison would. Uh, yeah, I think Paul in the New Testament, he also said, let the one who steals work so that he may learn to steal no more. Uh, but then, I mean, getting back to your point, which was about the death penalty, um, that really brings up a whole lot of questions in my mind, at least, of, of jurisdictional boundaries, right? Um, so if I want to establish the law in my life and my Christian community also wants to establish the law in their lives, then I think really any, the basis of any society is founded on like, what is the absolute last resort to fix some horrible thing that somebody did? Like if we don't have a solution for that or a way forward, then it's kind of like, you know, wh what are you, what are you going to do if your house burns down? You got to have some kind of plan for what happens in an emergency. Otherwise, the first time a, a community really gets like challenged, they're just going to crumble and fall apart. They won't last very long. So I really think that that's up to the community of believers to start taking responsibility for our own mess. And let's um, Paul Paul kind of invokes some death penalty language in First Corinthians. I think it's the end of chapter five. There was a man who took his father's wife. Right. And Paul said, like, you guys are prideful about this. You're you're being you're acting arrogantly. Like, aren't you not rather to mourn? Let him who's done this be expelled from among you. And Paul's quoting there from a passage in the Old Testament, uh, purge the evil from among you, which is only used in connection with death penalty. So in other words, okay, you guys need to apply the death penalty to this guy, and if he retreats, then he's excommunicated, you have nothing to do with him. My question is, like, for the death penalty in particular, like, shouldn't we as believers want to own our mistakes even unto death? I mean, for heaven's sake, we're called to do it for, for other people if they're in need. Um, so, like, if I've done something, somebody wants to accuse me of doing something wrong, if I did it, I will, like, I, I, I want to own that. Uh, now, would I, when push comes to shove, I don't know, I've never been in that situation. I hope I would. Um, but I, I would think that if somebody is repentant, then I think his community should be responsible for putting him to death. That's what repentance would look like. And the Bible actually talks about the death penalty as being an atonement, which is really counter to what, the way that I feel about it. But I think um, um, one, one key place where that was done was um, the Israelites had been intermarrying with other nations and things like that. And God had sent a plague and like tens of thousands of people had died from this plague. One of the priests went and he threw a spear through one of the men and the wife that he had taken from another nation. And when he did that, God stopped the plague immediately. And David writes of him in one of the Psalms saying that that was that atonement that that priest did. Uh, what was his name? Phinehas. Phinehas the priest. Um, 
God accounted that atonement as righteousness to him and his family forever. That's David writing of him in the Psalms. So I think we're supposed to be, the Bible is, is for us to apply really hard to ourselves. And I think when, when unbelievers see that, they'll be drawn to that because it's really bitter at first and like sweet in the end, if that makes sense. Right. I don't know about, I think the scripture in 1 Corinthians doesn't necessarily talk about the death penalties because I think it might use some of the same phraseology, but it is, that's 1 Corinthians 5, right? Yeah, 1 Corinthians 5. Yeah, if I remember that passage right, it talks about he needs to be, yes, the evil needs to be expelled among you and handed over to the devil is what it says. Um, yeah, let but, him be handed over to Satan. Right, but it finishes that passage saying... That his soul he, might be saved in the day of soul, judgment. Well, and elsewhere, I don't know if it's in First Corinthians or if it's somewhere else in the Pauline epistles, but he talks about um, a very similar situation and bringing them back into the church community, right? They're not... In a later epistle, yes. I'm not sure if it was talking about the same guy, that's a really interesting question. I don't think in that later epistle he specifies who he's talking about. Right. I don't think... Could, could be. Yeah. I've never interpreted... I, I guess I have to go back and read it, but I've never interpreted that as talking about the death penalty. Um, it seems more that he's pushing it. I've always interpreted it as, you're, you know, you're being excommunicated. You're being kicked out of the church. And... And I think that that would be, that would satisfy a death penalty. Like, at least as far as our community is concerned, he's not here anymore. Right. Well, it, but it doesn't say to ignore him. It just says to treat him like an unbeliever. Right. right. So you could still, like, trade with him at the store or whatever, but he's just, you, you, you know, he's just as lost as any other guy out there. Right. Um, yeah, I think that the idea of a death penalty as an atonement is interesting, but in our New Testament, we don't need an atonement, right? We don't need any sort of atonement because um, Jesus is our atonement. Hebrews covers that. You know, it's the blood of Jesus that, and even putting me to death, that death penalty, like, that's not, you know, that still isn't, I deserve eternal death, not just death right now. Yeah. And so putting me to death for my sins um, is part of what I deserve, but not it entirely. And the right. only way we can get around that is, I mean, the only way, even in the Old Testament, the only way people were forgiven was um, Romans says that because God looked forward to Jesus' sacrifice and he counted that for them what, before it even happened. That's the only way anybody has ever gone to heaven and is capable of being with God is because of Jesus' sacrifice, whether Old Testament or New Testament. And the sacrifices of old, the atonements of old, um, were not actually to pay that atonement because they couldn't. Because a goat cannot save you. It was just to represent what Jesus was going to do in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that 100%. And so the question is, like, how should I evidence that out in my life to an unbeliever? Am I going to shirk my responsibility? Let's say I, God forbid, I did kill somebody. Should I run away from the consequences of that or should I own up to it? And then, like, can you imagine what kind of a message that would send to unbelievers like these people? When, when they do something wrong, or even if they're, they're falsely accused of it, or if they actually did it, they're like, they're jumping all over themselves to fix what they did and pay for it. And it's not because I'm trying to atone for myself. It's showing evidence of what somebody else already did for me. I want to own my mistakes and fix them. And then I think part of the pattern is you, like priests, right? Priests are like a go-between between the people and God so that the people won't be destroyed and that the people can also offer to God something that God will actually accept. And so we're, the New Testament talks about us being a nation of priests. So we as believers are priests, so God won't destroy the unbelievers. We're here to sort of be that go-between. And then also we want to make the unbelievers worthy of coming in to be with God, sh to show them that that's how our high priest, he's a high priest along with us. He's a, New Testament calls him our brother. We're brothers of Christ. So now we can show God's holiness to them without them being destroyed and goodness, the goodness of it and actually draw them in to the fold to be priests along with us. I think that's what the new new covenant is all about, the Great Commission. Like, uh, go therefore and teach, teach the nations all things whatsoever I have commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
So it's, we want to show them evidence and we don't want to shirk our responsibility for, for paying for things. And that, I think that goes up to and includes, would include the death penalty. I think we're a long way from that. I'm thinking like, I want to start talking about this stuff just to get people thinking about it for the next hundred years or, or whatever. Um, but so yeah, it's, it's an uphill battle for sure. Right. And I think that on a personal front, if I commit a sin, yeah, obviously the, the Bible calls me to repent. Yeah. And, but then I think then the question is, what do we as a group of believers do? Cause you're right. You know, we repent and we go to our group of believers and what do we do about that? Um, well, but so we also see in the Bible that like, like with Paul, that we that there is such thing as a group of believers who find this man in sin worthy of death but as jesus says to the woman who was also worthy of death go and sin no more right and so we you know we have these punishments outlined for us in the old testament and i don't think that they necessarily apply to us in the new testament and it requires more discretion and really uh communion with the Holy Spirit, understanding what God wants for this person and what God is, you know, if God's drawing them to repentance, then who are we to put a stop to that by ending their life, right? Yeah, there's a lot to discuss there, um, especially with the whole thing about the woman caught in adultery. First thing, I'm not, everything that I've looked into on that passage says it's basically one of the, it has one of the most dubious authenticities. It's not actually found in Greek. It's found in Latin 400 years after the earliest manuscripts that we have of John. And when it is found in John, it's not found in the same place. It's found in different places throughout the book. Just that whole chunk just jumps around. Well, but he does it too with the Samaritan woman at the well. She was yeah. also deserving a death because she had, she was an adulteress and you know, same thing. Yeah, well, for, the, for that, it would be a question of, well, obviously she's a Samar Samaritan. So Samaria was not really re known for its uh, adherence to scripture. They, they built their own temple, for heaven's sake. Um, there's also something to be said for witness requirements, right? If one person, if it's a he said, he said versus she said thing, there's really not really much anybody can do. I don't know if y'all have been following the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard thing, but it's sort of like, She's been saying all these things to him without any proof, and she's saying them all by herself. Uh, how do you, how do you establish something when one person says something and there's no other? The Bible says it's it's on the evidence of two or three witnesses. You're not supposed to hear an accusation against somebody on the testimony of one witness. So the Samaritan woman, I I don't know what her situation was. Were there other witnesses? I, I don't know. Jesus knew what she had been doing because he was God, obviously. Um, and then with the, the woman caught in adultery, the law also says that the witnesses are supposed to cast the first stones. Jesus asked the people that brought him before her, okay, who's going to throw the first stone? And they all go home. But in that, he, he does say, he who, I don't know. He who's without that, sin, let him cast first sin. stone. Right. It's, it's beyond just he who is the witness of this. So... Yeah, I, I do have to take off in a moment. And it's about but, to start raining, so I need to pack up here, yeah, too. Do you want help packing up? Uh, sure, that'd be great. It was Joel? Joey. Joey. Close enough. And Sean. Sean. Good to meet you, Sean. Thanks so much for coming out. Yeah, so what church are you uh, a part of?